This is StoryBeat, storytellers on storytelling. An exploration into how master storytellers and artists develop and build brilliant stories and works of art that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators of all kinds find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on StoryBeat. We're coming to you from the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University in the heart of downtown Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a rating or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great StoryBeat episodes to you. My guest today, Patrick Page, is one of the most gifted and versatile actors working on today's stage and screen. As a young child, Patrick watched his father perform Shakespeare at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival in Ashland, and that's where the theater bug took hold. If you're a theater goer, you may have seen Patrick on Broadway as Valentina in Casa Valentina, Rufus Buckley in A Time to Kill, the adult men in Spring Awakening, de Guiche in Sereno de Bergerac, Norman Osborn, a.k.a. the Green Goblin in Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark, Henry VIII in A Man for All Seasons, The Grinch in How the Grinch Stole Christmas, Decius Brutus in Julius Caesar, Scar in The Lion King, Lumiere in Beauty and the Beast, multiple roles in the Kentucky Cycle, as well as numerous other roles on stages throughout New York. Patrick's regional theater credits span 25 years of performances in dozens of productions, including working at the Utah Shakespeare Festival, the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, the La Jolla Playhouse, the Paper Mill Playhouse, the Seattle Repertory Theater, Long Wharf Theater, Pioneer Theater Company, Arizona Theater Company, ACT, Indiana Repertory Theater, Missouri Repertory Theater, and the Cincinnati, Cincinnati Playhouse, among others. Patrick's television credits include The Good Wife, Elementary, Flesh and Bone, Law and Order SVU, and many others. Interestingly, Patrick is the founder of the Patrick Page Acting Studio in New York City, where he teaches on an ongoing basis. In addition to the studio, he's taught acting and Shakespeare at the NYU Graduate Actor Training Program, the Tisch School of the Arts, the Shakespeare Lab, the Academy of Classical Acting, the Broadway Theater Project, the Alabama Shakespeare Festival MFA program, Southern Utah University, Emporia State University, and Whitman College, among many others. Patrick is also a playwright, so that's near and dear to my heart. His play Swan Song, which premiered at the Lucille Lortel White Barn Theater in Westport, was nominated for Best New Play by the American Theater Critics Association, and in 2006 was chosen by the New York City Summer Play Festival to play on Theater Row. Swan Song has received numerous regional productions. Patrick also wrote his one-man show, Passion's Slaves, which has toured the country extensively. He's currently working on a musical called Grand Illusion. Patrick is also a magician. This I've got to learn about. Mm -hmm. Honored by the International Brotherhood of Magicians as the best teen illusionist at their annual convention in 1979. He's also the recipient of the Helen Hayes Award, the William Shakespeare Award for Classical Theater, the Emery Battis Award, the Princess Grace Award in Theater, the Princess Grace Statue for Sustained Achievement, the Matador Award for Classical Acting, the Joseph Jefferson Award, and the Utah Governor's Medal for the Arts. Patrick is married to actress and Trading Spaces host Paige Davis, who also happens to be one of my all-time favorite guests on StoryBeat. I invite you all to please check out Paige's excellent Story Beat episode, and we're really fortunate today because Paige happens to be in the studio with us for a second time on Story Beat. And though Patrick and Paige live in Manhattan, Patrick happens to be with us in Pittsburgh right now for a few weeks playing Ebenezer Scrooge in the Pittsburgh CLO's annual production of A Musical Christmas Carol. And so I'm humbled to have both Paige and Patrick in the studio at the same time. And so here's the amazing Patrick Page. Patrick and Paige, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was very sweet of you to uh, say. Oh, well. The, you, it's, you know how to flirt with all the girls. Uh, <laughs> and some of the guys, too. I, <laughs> it's part of the job, you know. It's one of the, one of the job tra uh, descriptions. So, Patrick, I'm wondering, um, you're back in the Steel City now for what? how many times have you done this? Uh, last year was my first year. So this is your second time with yep. playing Ebenezer Scrooge. And and my second time in Pittsburgh. I have a history with the role. Uh, I first uh, played the part 
when I was about, I think, 22 or 23 years old. Really? Yeah, at a little place in uh, <clears throat> for my very first professional job, first time I was paid. I think my might have been the second time I was paid to be an actor. Um, a little theater called the Great American Melodrama in Oceano, California. Mm. And um, I played Ebenezer Scrooge. And uh, then uh, a bit later, uh, my father, who was an actor and a theater professor, wanted to do a version of Christmas Carol at his university, which is Western Oregon University. Mm -hmm. This was about 19, I would say, 87. And he couldn't find a version that he liked, and he asked me if I would adapt a version of it. So I wrote a version of it for him to perform, and they performed it there. You wrote it. I wrote it and directed it, and uh, and it was performed. And my father played Scrooge, and it was done there for about I think ten years. And he played Scrooge every year from the uh, time he was about sixty-five until he was about seventy-five. Wow! And it became his signature role. And everyone his his email was like Ebenezer Scrooge or something. And he everyone would give him Scrooge dolls and copies of Christmas Carol. So I had this long history of it. And then when I was in New York finally playing um, Lumiere in Beauty and the Beast, they were doing Alan Menken's version of A Christmas Carol at Madison Square Garden. I see. And I auditioned to for the standby position. Roger Daltrey, they had a star every year. And Roger Daltrey, the lead singer of The Who, was the star this particular year. And I was hired to stand by for Roger. And uh, since they did about 15 shows a week, the idea was that I would perform some of the time. But what happened was, you know, it's flu season in New York. <laughs> yes, everywhere. And, and everywhere. But New York is worse because you're riding the subway. You're in close contact with people. Here sure. you can sort of avoid getting it. But there you really can't. We, we get it here at school, by the way. Oh, that's, jammed yeah. jammed into classrooms. And, uh, and so Roger came down with something. And I ended up going on for 22 of the performances. Oh. <laughs> and it was a 5,000-seat house. And so they'd gotten a, a special dispensation from Actors' Equity Association that they didn't have to stuff the program. Normally, if an, an understudy or a standby is going to go on, they put an insert <laughs> in the program. And the insert says the role of Ebenezer Scrooge, normally played by Roger Daltrey, will be played by Patrick Page. But in this instance, because there were 5,000 seats, there was no way that the ushers could do it in the period of time. <laughs> and so they got a special dispensation from Equity that they could make an announcement instead of stuffing the program programs. And so every time I went on, uh, I would hear over the loudspeaker in Madison Square Garden, uh, the role of Ebenezer Scrooge, normally played by Roger Daltrey, would be will be played by Patrick Page, after which you would hear the most cacophonous <laughs> groan and boos and catcalling. And, uh, but it put me in the mood to play the part. And most of the time, by the end of the show, the the trajectory of the story, I think, had brought them along, and they were on my team by the end. So then I, I played that there, and then when this came up, uh, uh, Lori Berger and, and the other people here called me and asked me when their Scrooge that they'd had for over a decade retired, um, as Scrooges tend to. Yes. Um, it's a it's a very demanding role, and it's a very demanding role for an older man, so they tend to grow to the point where they say, oh, I don't... I don't want to do this anymore. And she called and asked if I would do it, and I, I, I jumped at it. Well, I, you know, I, I've seen you do it, so I, I know, and I'm, I'm going to see you again shortly, I know how good you are in the part. I mean, it's, and it is a role that takes you on a roller coaster from one type of emotion to a very different type of emotion. Yeah. And so how you bring the audience along on that, I guess, is, is very, very important. Is there a particular method other than doing the script the way it is? Is there something that you do to try to take the audience on that ride with you? Well, it's an interesting question because initially... All I do is what I would do with any role, which is try to listen and respond to the people mm -hmm. I'm playing with. Um, but the nature of this particular part is uh, each story point has to be nailed down so specifically. And if you miss one of them, if you miss one of the points of his conversion... I don't know whether it's a problem for the audience, but it's a problem for me. Interesting. If I don't actually experience uh, the point where I, where something drops in for me, 
and I understand something that I didn't understand before, then when I get to the end and I have the moment where I need to have the epiphany, the epiphany won't come to me. Interesting. And so I, it's not a role that I can mark in technically. I have to, not that any role is really, but uh, one of the things about playing a big classical role, and I would count Scrooge among those kinds of roles, is learning to pace yourself and where to take your rests. When Richard Burton played Hamlet and John Gielgud was directing him, Gielgud said to him, uh, I'm not, I don't want to give you my Hamlet. I don't want to tell you anything about Hamlet. This is going to be your Hamlet. What I can help you with is where you can rest because it's three and a half hours and you need to pace yourself. Mm -hmm. And Burton said the most valuable thing that he learned from him is where to take his rest. So over this last week, I've been learning where I breathe, where I take my rests, where I can slip a little mint into my mouth to keep myself can go, from going completely dry because I never leave the stage. Right. It's just really little technical tricks like that in addition to then hopefully playing it truthfully. So you were saying earlier, performance, uh, you know, especially when you're on stage the whole time, is really about keeping yourself in the moment where you're reacting to what people are saying to you. Yes. And in this case, you had you, you were telling me earlier, but let's tell the audience, how many, how many rehearsals did you have? I had two rehearsals. Two? Well, I was doing... We've been working on a new musical for the last couple of years. Yeah. Beautiful new piece called Hadestown by Inez Mitchell, which Rachel Chavkin is directing. And we did it off-Broadway at New York Theatre Workshop, and it was very successful. And so now they're positioning it and moving it on toward Broadway. And one of those steps is doing it way out of town where we can do our work and nobody is going to bother us. Sure. So we took it to Edmonton, Alberta. And that, uh, that contract went until December 5th, and I was scheduled to have an audience here uh, on December 8th. So we <laughs> flew in, did two days of rehearsal, and but it was all right because uh, I worked it and worked and worked it while I was in Canada, so I knew the lines cold. They showed me, or reminded me really, where the moves were from last year. And then we played it, and it was really like uh, more the work you do when you're on a television set where you go in, you're expected to know your words. Sure. The director shows you, camera blocks you, shows you where the cameras are going to be, and then you shoot it. it. Sure. And so that's what this was like. So in a way, it, it's almost maybe, I'm, I'm thinking, it might be helpful in a way that you're literally reacting to stuff that you didn't see before. That's... Right. That's so, absolutely so as opposed right. to over rehearsing it, where you've seen it too much. That's absolutely right. I mean, you know, some actors. Brando was famous for <laughs> refusing to rehearse because he wanted to. He wanted to be there with what was happening in the moment. And he wanted to get the surprise of the moment. So. Um, well, allegedly, in the last roles that he had, he had an earpiece and he was getting the lines fed to him. Yeah, he, I mean, he he got very lazy. I think at the end, but I mean, he was probably our greatest have, actor. Have you worked with any actors who require some kind of extra help like that? And I'm not asking you to name names. I'm just wondering if that technique well, I, has ever come when, uh I I've worked with some actors, you know, in their 70s and 80s, and the reality of uh, the human body is the brain is just like every other part, mm -hmm. you know. And when you're 80, you can't lift the same weight you could when you were 40, and you can't remember the same number of lines you could mm -hmm. in most instances. And so I have worked with actors who've worn an earpiece and not a one of them liked it. Um, they all resented it. They resented the fact that they couldn't learn. They were brilliant actors, that they couldn't learn the lines as well. It terrified them. And, uh, and it terrifies me. Um, and so I try to learn a lot of material all the time. I try to constantly memorize things. I just put together a new one-man show about uh, Shakespeare's exploration of evil. Oh, really? And that involved me over a period of two months learning about two hours of Shakespearean material. And that's good because, uh, you know, I'm 55, so it keeps your brain sure. working Flu on fluid. something. Sure, yeah. yeah. it keeps you uh, elastic. Yeah. Gilgood said he, you know, he lived into his 90s, and he said uh, every day he would learn one sonnet a day, 14 lines of verse is all, but he would learn a new one every day. Wow. 
I, I, I can't use it or lose it. Use it or lose it is correct. <laughs> I can't tell you what I had for breakfast. So that's you know this is this is a big problem for a lot of people, uh, not just on stage, but in particular, it would be a really big problem because that's half of at least half of what you need to do. Yeah, I went through a period of years where I was having a big problem, uh, and it was terrifying to me. And I found out it was a medication I was on. Uh, and once I got rid of that, my memory, my ability to memorize things, it, came back. it had fogged you up a bit. Yes, that's yeah, that's true for lots of medications. So that's an interesting thing for performers to be aware of. That if you are on a medication and you're having trouble with something, maybe that might be something to look toward. Exactly. So let's go back a little bit. When you were growing up, you were watching your dad do Shakespeare, yeah? Yeah, my first memories are. And they're probably not even real memories, you know. You, I, I'm very suspicious of memory uh, because I tend to remember things that there are pictures of mm. or stories I've been told, and uh, not remember the things that there aren't pictures of mm. and stories I haven't been told. So I think memory is really uh, malleable and really fallible. But but nevertheless, my father had the very first line in both plays in the season in 1964. He played Orsino in Twelfth Night, and he played Antonio in The Merchant of Venice. And in both cases, they have the first line, and in both cases, the line is uh, in amazingly sensual in terms of its sound. In Twelfth Night, the line is, if music be the food of love, play on. Mm. And in The Merchant of Venice, the line is, in sooth, I know not why I am so sad. <laughs> So in both instances, they're really vowel-heavy lines, and children love vowels. Children don't sit in a in a, in a, a crib or in their beds or in their play pens going. <coughs> Adults do that. That's swearing. That's why all swear words are like. <coughs> no, kids go ooh ah ooh ah. You make sounds. And they're sensual and they and uh, it's enjoyable. And I learned to love sound. And I'm, ever since I was a kid, I, I've had a lot of trouble sleeping. And so the way my father would put me to sleep was he would put on an LP of uh, Shakespeare. Shakespeare. Not a ringing endorsement for Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just and I would listen. Kidding, I, I, yeah, I know, I know. But I would listen. Any, but just something to keep me company, you know. Right. Um, sometimes a musical. I remember I, I listened to Annie Get Your Gun sometimes. Uh, Who was doing the Shakespeare recordings? Well, there was one that I listened to all the time. Was there was a full LP of um, Olivier's film of Richard the Third? Oh, really? Yeah, and uh, uh, I listened to that over and over and over again. And his voice was extremely mellifluous. Well, uh, strangely, his was really consonantal. Really, right? That's what he was famous for because at the time the verse speaking was, and I and I think I learned about verse speaking in that way a little bit. Because Gilgood was in it too, and all verse speaking back then in the 30s and 40s was all Gilgood's way of speaking the verse was the way uh, that people spoke the verse. Um, Gilgood was all um, me fought the Gloucester stumbled. Uh, upon the giddy footing of the hatches, it was all drawn out like that. Whereas Olivier was, now is the winter of our discontent, made glorious summer by this son of York. He refused to elongate a vowel. He called it singing. And he was trying to change the way people spoke verse. And I think listening to that early on, both of those ways of approaching the verse, maybe I was able to sort of put them together into something, take the best from both of them. Well, you clearly have a great memory for that all the way back then. That was many years ago, obviously. And you're you're doing those guys, I thought they were in the studio for a second. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, would you say that uh, that's when you started to really understand that this was what you were going to do with your life? I, I knew I wanted to be up there. I remember saying to my mom and dad, and there was a green show stage. The green show is a show before the play. Out, these are outdoors in an Elizabethan style theater. And before the show, there's a what's called a green show, which is singing and dancing. And I remember pointing up to the stage and I said, I want to do that. And so when we got back uh, home, they put me in ballet classes because they thought I wanted to be a dancer. And I was complete, I couldn't do it at all. And it wasn't what I wanted. 
And then I started putting on plays in the basement, uh, and I would write the plays and direct them and, uh, and, and force my little brother to play the supernumerary roles, and I would play all the leading parts. And uh, my first one was... Are you, are you still doing that to this day? I, 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 it, to you, some you extent. No, he just makes me do it. Yeah. No, I just got rid of everyone else. You now play, I just do one-man yeah, shows. You're, you're the right. leading guy, now just yeah. do one-man shows. That's a great way to do it, yeah. and then you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, but I, and my dad would bring home like scenery pieces from uh, the college uh, theater department and actual theatrical lights from the college theater department we put on these things and he would make posters he was also a printer he had a printing press and so we made these quite lovely posters and one of them was for a play that I had in quotations written written means that I made it up as I went along <laughs> and um well, that's a form of writing. Yeah, it was called Dr. Jekyll Meets Frankenstein. No. Yes, in which I played both Dr. Jekyll and Frankenstein. Oh, my God. Uh, and now you're really near and dear to my heart. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that was, that was and, then, and then I wanted to be, I told them I wanted to be a doctor, and they got me a doctor kit. But in fact... <laughs> Uh, he just wanted to play doctor. I wanted on to play TV. a doctor. You wanted That's to play right. one I on TV. I wanted to play one on TV. So I, I wanted the white lab coat and the stethoscope, and then I was happy. <laughs> and and so, so theater really was essentially your first creative love. Yeah. Yeah, and which is I think kind of unusual. Some kids get it right away, and it takes others much longer. So you've been at this for your whole life, essentially. Yeah, all your, of all, your whole your whole uh, life that you remember, really. Yes, and I always wanted to. Uh, go to the theater with my dad every night for rehearsal. It was oh. exciting. It was exciting to you. Yeah, I'm gonna just sit there and watch. Because uh, it was always exciting to me as a kid, and I, and I got into it not as young as you, but I was in my teens, and so I understand getting that that bug bit in India very very young. Yeah, and uh, I don't know to what extent, frankly, it was about the theater, or to what extent it was about my dad. Sure, wanting to go with my dad. But uh, in either event, it hooked in early. Now, I'm assuming at that age, I mean, you have a magnificent voice. You know that. That's a great instrument you have. And I'm assuming at that age, you didn't have this instrument. It was precisely the same. It was very weird for a little kid. <laughs> really? Yeah, I was three years old, and this is what I sounded like. <laughs> they, you know what? They probably kept you in a box, didn't they? <laughs> no, but my dad did sound like this. He did? Uh, yeah, and um, when I was growing up and I was... Uh, a teenager and my voice changed uh, when we would answer the phone people would always mistake us for one another oh is that right yeah interesting so um, tell us a little bit about your training what you obviously you started doing it very young but where did you did you get formal training right then and there or did you what, when did you really f get f the formal training that you now have I don't think I have any formal training is um, it really uh, I That's have, interesting I have a lot of uh, I resisted formal training, which I don't think is a virtue on my part. Um, when I doesn't seem to have hurt you any. Well, when I graduated from high school, I'd done a, a lot of plays in high school and as a kid, and I did at that point go to a training program that w is in California to this day called the Pacific Conservatory of Performing Arts (PCPA Theater Fest). I have a dear friend of mine that was there for years. Yeah, who? John Daly. Do you know John Daly? I, yeah, John Gillard Daly. John Gillard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's correct. Um, I went to I went to school with him. Yeah, I I don't know him personally, but I know who he is, um, and uh, I think I got some training there. That was the first place that uh, someone began to really teach me Stanislavski. Mm. And my father had taught me some, but was teaching me really mainly Strasbourg. And, which I, I didn't they're, find. They're related. Well, Strasbourg is an offshoot of Stanislavski, yeah. uh, uh, and a great deal of stuff that Stanislavski later abandoned mm -hmm. um, in terms of using sense memory and uh, every actor, uh, every actor, I think unconsciously, naturally uses sense memory, but um, but the emphasis on it as kind of the be all and end all of process, I think, was destructive. But anyway, um, destructive for you or, or for the industry? Uh, both. Both. I think um, uh, it, that's a that's a much longer conversation sure. about acting. But um, but anyway, so I think the first person who started to teach me uh, how to play an action, how to play an intention, what an objective was, uh, was Donovan Marley at PCPA Theater Fest. But I didn't have a lot. Uh, we didn't get to implement it a lot. Um, what does that? What do you mean? It wasn't implemented. You were well. We were in, not in class that much. We were really there 
uh, we were kind of interns. There was a professional company in which we played the, the small roles, the spear carriers, the people who moved the furniture. I learned a lot because I watched some very, very good actors, Byron Jennings, Michael Winters, Mark Harlick, uh, playing major roles. Mm -hmm. And I would, st it, it was a, a theater, it was a, a thrust theater, like the Guthrie Theater, or like the, the festival stage in Stratford. And so it has two vomitoria. And you could stand in the vom and watch the show. And so every night when, when Byron is on, or Mark was on, or Michael was on, I would stand in the vom and just watch their work. And mm -hmm. just, what are they doing? What, why is that? Why does that seem truthful to me when the thing next to them doesn't seem truthful and try to figure that out. But then when I, um, when I, that was just a two year program. And it was designed to sort of put you into uh, the, what was then called the league schools. The league schools were Juilliard, Yale, ACT, et cetera, et cetera. There were 10 of them, I think. And I auditioned for some of them and I, didn't get into many of them. I did get into one, which was the University of Washington, which was a very good program at the time. And I, I, I got um, cold feet about it. Why? I'm not 100% sure. Okay. Part of it was um, did that Did it feel I, restrictive to you or confined? Yeah, part of it was that I was having a really good time trying to understand acting on my own. Mm. And I kind of didn't want someone to come in and impose something on mm -hmm. that. I was in the middle of something that I hadn't finished. And um, but did you face like self doubt because you didn't get into those? Oh other yes, schools? of course, and of so, course, of course. You know, well maybe I you know don't want to do this, or maybe I shouldn't be doing this, or can't do this. Or... No, I didn't think that, but I definitely had uh, you know some shame and self doubt. It plays on your mind when you get rejected. Sure, it's, sure. Any rejection. It's it's remembering back to the time when. You had no idea whether this could work as a career, you know. But the other reason was that uh, I had been studying only acting and theater-related things for two years, and I was really hungry to study history and uh, English literature and some other things. So I went to a liberal arts college called Whitman College um, to study English lit, and that's where I studied Shakespeare in depth and Yeats and... Uh, I, I've always felt that that was a really good move because... It's, I think it's an excellent move. I think people that go to school that want to be in show business but study other things yeah. tend to be deeper, richer, uh, better at the craft. It, it worked for me is all I can say. Mm -hmm. And um, while I was at Whitman, uh, this is a funny story. I don't know how long we have, but this is kind of how I got my first job. I got all day. <laughs> um <laughs> Well, it's a, it's a good story for someone who's interested in, in getting into the business. I was at Whitman, and there, uh, a, a, a sign went up on the call board for, uh, they were looking for people for the Utah Shakespeare Festival, mm. which was uh, a, an Elizabethan replica style globe theater in Cedar City, Utah. And I saw on the, on the bulletin board, that they had some really important actors, actors that I had seen at Ashland and, and admired tremendously, uh, playing leading parts. And yet here was this thing on the board at my college that said uh, they were looking for people. So I went to the director of my program, or the theater program rather, at Whitman, and said, uh, do you think that I could audition for this? And do you think I would have a chance? And he said, no, uh, they don't take actors from places like Whitman uh, that really is for the technical crew what they do is they take program they take actors from the league schools well I had gotten into a league school but I had decided not to go there so whether it was out of stupidity or arrogance I can't remember but I had the temerity to call up the man who ran the University of Washington and who I had turned down and say, I'd like to audition with your students. And he said, well, no, that's not how it's done. You turned me down. Right. My 
my students will be auditioning and there won't be time. And I said, well, if there is time, could I audition with your students? And he said, well, there won't be time. And I said, I understand there won't be time. But if I were to come, it was a five-hour drive from Walla Walla to Seattle. If I were to come and there were time, could I audition with your students? And he said, I... I, I'm not, I suppose you could, but don't come. There won't be time, and it's nice. this isn't how it works. Um, you're not I, in. I can guess where this is going. You're not yeah. in the program. Okay, so the day of the audition, I drive the five hours. Sure. I show up. I look everywhere. I can't find the place. Long story short, I get there, and there's always you know a, an auditor at a table with a sign in. She says, "Who are you? Are you not from the program?" I'm Patrick Page. Bob Hobbs said I could audition with your students. <laughs> Magic words. She said, no, you, you can't. We, um, you're not a member of the program. I said, well, I'll, you know, I'll just wait here, and when the guy comes out, I'll see. She said, no, you can't wait here. You Wait outside. Well, it was January. So I'm waiting outside. It's cold as hell. And Eventually, the man who was the casting director was a man named Sanford Robbins who ran a program in Milwaukee, Wisconsin at that time came out and I kind of made a little noise and he looked and he said well, what about him and the young woman who was with him said well he's not he's not one of our students and uh, and Sandy said do you want to audition and I said <laughs> yeah <laughs> and she said no 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 Sandy you're already late for your plane you're going to miss your plane and Sanford Robbins I, I reminded him of this since because this was the beginning of my career and it wouldn't have happened had he not said this Sanford Robbins when she said you're late for your plane he said there'll be another plane oh how nice and he took me in and he auditioned me and at the end of it he said I really like you he said I could use you in my show I know that he was directing Tame Me the Shrew but I, I have to talk to the other two directors well I didn't hear I didn't hear I didn't hear and it was now, I knew I wasn't going to get in because I was supposed to hear February or March. On April 23rd, which was Shakespeare's birthday, I got a call, and they said, we'd like you to join wow, the company. Wow, how nice. So I must have been an alternate. Someone else must have dropped out. But I got in, and I stayed with that company for six years, and that was my first professional job. It's, a, it's amazing how these miraculous little things happen yeah. in a career. And you need, you need at least one or more of you those do. in a career. And you have to... You, you, either, you have to be a bit stupid, a bit naive. You know, Orson Welles said, if I, they asked him how Citizen Kane happened, and he said, because I didn't know it couldn't. Exactly right. I didn't know what I didn't know. No, his training for Citizen Kane, not to be uh, diverge off this, but Citizen Kane, he learned most, or allegedly learned most of what he knew about directing from watching jo uh, John Ford's stagecoach 40 times in a yeah. row. Yeah. And that's how he learned to what he wanted to do with the camera and how yeah. to direct. Well, and he had Greg Tolan as a cinematographer. That so he would, <laughs> so uh, and, and they didn't know. He would say, I want to do a shot where I want to do, uh, you know, I, I want to be able to see both in foreground and background. Foreground and background. Yeah, and sure. he, nobody told him he couldn't do that. Right. So he started creating all these things, and he'd studied, you know, like the Nuremberg rallies. He looked at the lighting in the Nuremberg rallies. So it's all lit with those shafts of light like Nuremberg. Anyway, uh, I didn't know what I didn't know. And so, uh, and then I was able to make a success in Cedar City, and I stayed there for six years. That led to me being hired in Ashland, which is where I always wanted to be because that's where my dad was. I you, stayed, grew, you grew up there, right? I, I grew up not in... But, but around there. Yeah, around there. And uh, I stayed there for a couple of years, and then that led to uh, doing regional jobs, and regional jobs eventually led to New York. What, what was the job that took you to New York? What it was you? the play The Kentucky Cycle. The Kentucky Cycle. I was doing a play in That's Seattle. Robert Schenken, yeah. Yeah, I was doing a play in Seattle, which is where The Kentucky Cycle started. I didn't start with it there, but I took a meeting with... Uh, Warner Shook, who was the director, mm -hmm. and he said, I think there might be something for you in this. I auditioned, and now that was another story because he called me after I auditioned. I'd waited several weeks, and he said, Patrick, we liked you a lot, and we'd love to use you in the show in New York, but I've called around about you, and people say you're difficult to work with. Wow. And... Um, I said, well, did you ask this person? Yes. Did you ask that person? Yes. And they said I was difficult. They said, yes. 
Um, that must have played with your brain a little. A little bit. And then I said, well, did you ask this person? And it was Libby Apple, who was then the artistic, or becoming the artistic director of the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. And I played Hamlet for her. And Libby, she said, he, Warner said, Libby said, it, it will probably be difficult because I was offered an ensemble role in the Kentucky Cycle. And that, that she didn't think that would sit well and that I would try to direct everyone around me, which I think I had a habit of doing. Mm. And so I had to learn to stay in my lane. Mm. And I said, to, um, I said to Warner, I said, okay, I'm learning about myself right now. And uh, probably wasn't that eloquent about it. Um, and I said, I guarantee you that I will not be difficult. If you'll use me, I'll be a team player. And he did, and I was, and things worked. But I had to hear it. You almost you almost had to get slapped over it. I did, yeah. Uh, and and uh, so, w- would you say that at that ha- around what age were you at this point? I was around thirty one. So you'd been around a while. Yeah, I played a lot of leading parts regionally, and uh, and so you were a little bit full of yourself. I at think that I was, point. yeah, yeah. And and it's it's interesting how that you know that it's. It's a blessing that you got that told to you. Or oh, you, yeah. You might have killed your career right there. Yeah. And then my next job, which was at the Public Theater, Stephen Burkhoff directing Richard II, I had to write in my journal, you know, stay in your lane, uh, don't try to direct, because I knew the play backwards and forwards. I just played the part. And he didn't exactly have the reputation of being a pussycat. No, exactly. Stephen, for those who don't know, is uh, known as a, 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 a monster. A tough SOB. Yeah, I mean, he's a genius. He is an absolute genius and remains a dear friend to this day. But I had to, I had <laughs> hey, to say Paige to Paige is smiling widely. <laughs> just took a picture. Uh-oh. Someone just came in the window Uh-oh. and took a picture. I had to say to myself, whatever Stephen says, I will not argue. I will not question. I will just do it. Do it. And I've had a I've had a uh, a rule, a hard and fast rule ever since, which is no matter what a director says, no matter how wrong I might feel it might be, I will I will do it three times in rehearsal, full out, before I will then go to them privately and say, you know, I'm not finding a way to make mm. this work. Maybe we can can we work on how this? How often do you find that somebody suggests something that you feel is wrong? You try it the three times and it actually turns into something better. Does that uh, ever happen? Yes. Uh, Paige, uh, it's not that I tried three times, but when I was doing Casa Valentina, there was a moment where Paige said, you know, this moment is absolutely beautiful where you do this thing and you sort of, it, it, we, we see the cost of the, the emotional weight of this. It was a physical moment. A, and a, a subtle one. A subtle, subtle one. one. And uh, I said, oh, that was Joe Mantello. Mantello gave that to Literally me. Literally told him to do it. <laughs> wow. And he was um, like, I can't do that. And I'm like, oh, well, it's beautiful. So yeah. one, one of the things that I teach in my classes is the notion of note taking. Being a note taker when somebody's you're sitting in a room as a writer, because this is my, my background it's mostly as a writer. And when you're sitting in a room and some person across the table from you offers up the dumbest note you've ever heard in your life and you go I don't even know where to begin with that and and instead of rejecting it I always teach people listen to it take it in go home and think about it because right. sometimes it'll turn into something else absolutely right about. Bill Ball who ran uh, American ACT, Conservatory yeah. th- for years wrote a book called A Sense of Direction and he had a theory of direction which he called the theory of positation and the theory of positation was that the unconscious will send you up your best stuff, but it's terrified. That's why it only sends it up when you're asleep. We're all geniuses in our sleep. Oh. We dream things that we wish we could write down, right? I'm, I'm a superhero. Right. <laughs> We're, we are absolute geniuses, the things we create. And he said, I need to get to that. So the theory of positation is he never said no to an actor. Never. Actor says playing Hamlet, I think I should do to be or not to be while wrapping myself in toilet paper. Then he says to the stage manager, go get a roll of toilet paper. Because the bad idea will eventually fall of its own weight. Sure. But in the meantime, the actor's getting somewhere. Sure. And by the way, that that notion is also totally relevant to improvisation. That's where, right. Where you're always saying yes, mm-hmm. correct? And so uh, this notion of going, being in the moment, all of that's of a piece. But knowing right. when you have time to do that and when you don't, I mean, that's where the maturity sure. and a, in being professional comes into play. Like, 
if you're coming in as Scrooge with two days of rehearsal and the rest of the cast is ready to go and tech is tomorrow. You can't screw around. You're like, right. well, I think Scrooge should be, right. you know, you just pr- probably should just do what you're yeah. told. And, 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 and it's as, as and you, find know, it the as best you, you both can. know better than anybody that, that it's, as you said earlier, about TV or even some film, uh, you have to come in and you do your thing. If yeah. you're on a Clint Eastwood movie, you damn well better know your, your that, lines. That's right. Come and they're on a it. tight, tight schedule. And I also want to interject going back just a little bit sure. in terms of Patrick's training. Um, I don't want anyone listening to this podcast, especially younger people coming up, to think that because he didn't necessarily go to a specific formal school for acting training after going to PCPA, that he didn't train. This is somebody who studied deeply all of the teachers, a voracious reader and studier of all the different books and or films and or everything else he could get his hand on. So Yes, self-taught, but self-taught with the guidance of all of the master's information at his disposal to discover and uncover. Yeah, and, and also and, you know, uh, and, I'm working with a lot of really good people, going to them. So how are you doing that? How did you get there? I'm quite fortunate uh, to work with amazing directors as well yes, along the uh, way. great directors. And then also, in addition to all of that, I, I chose my roles based not on my career but rather based on what I thought I might learn from them. So if I was offered holding a spear at the Guthrie, which might be a very good career move, or playing Hamlet at Alabama Shakespeare Festival, I would probably play Hamlet at Alabama Shakespeare Festival because I'm going to grow more, I'm going to learn more. Of course. And so it's, by, it's the an... time I was, uh, in, by the time I was 30, I had played... Uh, Hamlet, Brutus, Richard II, Henry V, Richard III, Mark Antony. Uh, I, I played Mercutio. I played most of the big Shakespeare parts by that time. And I'm sure I made tons of mistakes, but along the way, I learned a lot. You know, I, The idea of being a, a, a forever student, you know, not to say I'm amazing, I don't need to st- train is not what he I think the moment you stop learning you're right. basically dead that's right so you just keep growing that's right and because you're on this journey that never ends exactly right and and as an and as a journeyman actor you're really on a journey because you're traveling everywhere yeah and you're making all those mistakes and you feel silly afterwards you look back and go oh my gosh I I must have been so terrible in that, but you you grow. I've never written anything that wasn't perfect. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about revision and rewriting right. and beating it up and yeah. then walking away for a while and going, why did I do that? That's right. You know, Didn't it's, somebody it's, say, like, all writing is rewriting? All, yeah. all, all yes, all Great writing is certainly revision. It's all rewriting. It's not that I hate first drafts. I can't stand doing first drafts. I love to rewrite because that's where the art comes in. That's where you really develop as the thing that makes it what it is. It's the same with rehearsal. You're not, you know, your very first time standing on stage and doing it, you're not likely to be hitting it on all cylinders. That's right. And you're going to catch it later. No, and if you are, you're, you're probably not working correctly. That's probably right. Right. Or, or you're really not very good. Yeah. And you think you're great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> so, all right, I want to move on to a couple of other things because we're we're doing great. Um, I got to know about Spider Man. Ah, yeah. What do you want to know? You you were the original, right? Yes. Okay. So I, you don't have to give away any of trade secrets or anything you don't want to say. But I am curious about the process because clearly that's one of the most legendary, difficult getting it to the stage yeah. shows of all time. Well, just to remind anybody listening, you know, once the show was announced. And, of course, it was a big deal because Bono and Edge were attached and Julie Tamer was attached, and then you have this iconic, you know, Marvel comic figure. Um, there was a, then a long delay. During that delay, uh, the financial collapse happened. Mm-hmm. So the date that it was supposed to open got put off by another year. When I auditioned for the role... I was in the middle of a, one of my worst depressions. I, I have depression, which uh, I treat now uh, both with talk therapy and with uh, pharmaceutical therapy. Mm-hmm. And But at the time, it was before I was willing to accept any help from modern medicine, and uh, which I think is the way with a lot of actors because they're afraid that if they take an antidepressant or an SSRI, they will 
uh, not be able to work. Same thing with writers. Same thing with writers. And it's not true at all. Um, but anyway, I was afraid of that, and so I'd avoided taking antidepressants, and I'd simply live with depression for 25 years. Mm. And I was in the middle of a very, very bad one, and I, I almost couldn't audition. I went and I did this audition uh, after turning it down time and time and time again, and um, went very well, partially because I was in the middle of this kind of breakdown, which suited this uh, man coming apart at the seams pretty well. And I heard right afterwards... As the Green Goblin. He was, uh, played Norman Osborn. You said original Spider-Man. He was... Well, it, I meant, you, right. you meant the show, but just yeah. to clarify, in case I, people don't know, you're right. he was playing Norman Osborn and slash mentioned it, the I'd mentioned Goblin. it earlier, but neglected right, right, to right, re-remind. Right, re- uh, Norman Osborn's having a kind of a psychic breakdown in the play when he becomes the Green Goblin. Anyway. Uh, it's all about dualities. That's you've right. You've got Spider-Man as Peter Parker. You've got... That's right. It's all about du- mm-hmm. Jekyll and Hyde. It's, yeah. all, it's all based on Stevenson, by the way. So I got a call very shortly thereafter that said they loved my audition and uh, I was a, 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 a first choice of a lot of people but that the role uh, was now going to be offered to Alan Cumming wow and um, that's I'm, wow okay and uh, <laughs> so I said okay fine went on with my life uh, that's an everyday occurrence for actors you get close to something you don't get it and I wasn't even 100% sure I wanted it you know, because I had just finished doing a couple of these great big musicals. I finished doing Lion King, and the costume was quite crippling, and I uh, finished doing The Grinch, which is a very, very rigorous thing, and I had no idea what the physical requirements of uh, The Goblin would be, and I, I just wasn't sure I wanted to do it. And so I said, fine, went on, booked a year of work, and started going on with my life. Fast forward a year... We're getting ready to go out to the Old Globe, where I'm an associate artist, and I was uh, I was scheduled to play uh, George in The Madness of George the Third, and the Fool in King Lear, and we're packing, we're leaving to go the next morning to San Diego. We got a call on a Friday night at five thirty or six o'clock, and it was my agent saying, um, "Sit down, I'm going to make your weekend a little difficult." So you have an offer to play the Green Goblin <laughs> in Spider-Man. And I hadn't auditioned in a year. And the one audition I did wasn't a callback audition. It was just seven, ten minutes in the room, and that was it. That's not usually how you get a part. No, no. So uh, I said to my agent, I said, no, no, I think you're mistaken. Uh, I'm quite sure it's not an offer. They must mean a callback. They must mean a callback, or Julie wants to talk to me because I knew her from Lion King. Um, and they said, no, 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 it's an offer. We've been working on it for the last several days. This is the money. This is the, these are the perks. This is the, it's, a, it's done. It's a done deal. All you have to do is say yes. And I said, I, I don't know that I can do that. I'm scheduled to be in rehearsal day after tomorrow for the title part in this other show in San Diego. And um, so I said, I, I, I need an hour. And so Paige and I talked about it. And... Um, his agent said, I'll give you one hour. Yeah. <laughs> and, of course, his agent wanted him to take it because it would be more oh, money than working money, regionally in sure. San Diego. It, it, it's funny because I think actors might understand this. It was very emotional for me because I become super attached. I do a lot of I do a lot of preparatory work for a role. So I'd been working on... That's an understatement. I'd <laughs> been working on George III for about eight months. And... Uh, I studied the pathology. I'd studied all his history. I'd been to every museum to try to learn. I'm I'm working obsessively on this character, and letting go of the character was really hard. And I remember we were in the bedroom, and I was like, I started crying, saying, "I'm gonna I'm gonna let George go, and do this other thing." So that I did, took it, began rehearsal almost immediately because we were doing uh, initial rehearsals of the songs. Uh, so two weeks later, I was in a studio with Bono. and um, That must have been a little out of body. It was very out of body. I Tell said, him the story. I mean, I think he really wants to hear, like, the the down and dirty of how it got to the stage and all the difficulties of the stage putting it up itself. The, 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 but the you have to tell The process. But you have to tell him the story of what... Uh, what did he say to you about... Um, I'm going to try to... No, I said to yeah, him. Yeah, but he said something to you first, or... 
Yeah, I, can't, I don't remember in detail. Oh, crap. Um, <laughs> it, was, it, was some, it, was so, it was something <laughs> like, uh, he said, I'm going to, uh, I can't remember it now. But I basically, I told him, I'm gonna, the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to try to pretend you're not Bono, you know, because otherwise <laughs> I'm not going to be able to get through this, you know. Uh, but we rehearsed. Do you, do you know that Tom Hanks recently said he had to do the same thing with Meryl Streep on The Post? Yeah. Tom Hanks yeah. had to say that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I, I'm not surprised. I would have to do that with Meryl Streep. Meryl Streep came. I was playing Cymbeline in Central Park two summers ago. And she came and she hugged me and she whispered in my ear, this is the my favorite thing I've seen in the park. Oh, wow. It was a beautiful production to, directed by Dan Sullivan and I loved it a lot. It was really special. And uh, and I, I heard my voice go up three octaves. <laughs> and all, all I said, and I said it over and over, is, I, I'm just so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so happy. I'm so happy right now. That's all I said. So anyway, uh, we went into rehearsal. And you were not paying any attention to Bono being Bono. I'm trying. We rehearsed. Well, one of the things that was unusual about Spider-Man in terms of rehearsal is like, Full orchestra in a studio laying stuff down, and well, just, yeah, just for to, to working on the arrangements of the yeah. songs. And I like, wonder why they spent so also, much money. But also, there's no way to rehearse it's things. Crazy. You know, the, there's so much that happens technically. There's no way to rehearse it. You you you're in a room with tape on the floor, maybe a couple platforms, a stairway or something. But it's all effects. It's yeah, and so you don't know what's going to happen until you get in the theater. So eventually, we do get in the theater. The, the whole show is moving toward an effect at the end, which is a fight that happens over the audience between Arachne and Peter Parker, Spider-Man. And this enormous web that was supposed to come down didn't work. Mm. Not only did it not work, it could never be tried because it, it simply wouldn't, it, it, it never would have worked. The, the mechanics of it didn't work. So Julie didn't have the the huge coup de théâtre that she was supposed to have at the end of the show, um, and so we started trying to work out an ending, and then we're getting closer and closer and closer to previews. We still don't have an ending, so we stayed. For, for those who don't remember, we stayed in previews long time. Let's see: November, December, <laughs> January, February, March, April, May, June. We opened June fourteenth. So With that's different a, opening night dates being right. set. So first, it was the the opening, then the cast called it the opening, then the cast <laughs> called it the opening, <laughs> and then finally they actually had their opening. <laughs> yeah, and at the opening, which I think was in March, was when the critics finally said, "You know what? We're tired of waiting. We're coming anyway." And so they came to the show unfinished, and uh, and we did it. And of course, they just got eviscerated. The reviews were brutal. Um, and I, I know from brutal reviews. <laughs> I understand. Well, these, you know, I mean, when you're inside this, this is. I learned a lot from that, though, because what I learned is, and I, and I, since said, I think everybody, everybody, should be inside a national media false narrative at some point. It's not that many of the things. It's not that many of the things they said were not true. Some were true, and some were not. Um. But that what you realized is the gravitational pull of the story was such that it didn't matter if it was true. That once someone had hurt themselves, if then someone stubbed a toe, it would be on the cover of the New York Post the that next day. That they, you know, broken their foot. Um, and, and so since then, I've, I've read stories, especially stories that pile on to one another much more critically than I did before. Many people who had absolutely no association with Spider-Man in any way, shape, or form were commenting via Twitter or Facebook or whatever, like, you know, picket Spider-Man, save actors, but, and they had no idea what was happening in the building or how the actors even felt. They were a very tight-knit group, a, a camaraderie in that they felt safe. They loved their show. They were proud of their show. They knew it had, of course, it had all its issues. People were tired. It was what it was, but it was getting reported by people who had no association well, whatsoever. I, I don't want to give the impression that everyone felt safe at all times. There were people who were scared. And there were people who felt safe, and there was all sorts of different emotions. Well, you had a humongous technical uh, Humongous effect. technical, and then, as you recall, 
our friend Chris Tierney had a terrible fall. Yes. Um, I think it, when people remember it, they think it had something to do with the flying in the show. It didn't. He wasn't flying at the time. He fell off the edge of the stage into the pit. Um, but nevertheless, it was what it was. He was hurt very, very badly. And he's back now. Um, I, he came he back. He was back in the show he six ba- months later. Not six months, six weeks. No, but three months. Something. Three months, yeah. maybe. Yeah, three months. Anyway, sorry. Anyway, um, so I, I learned about that. But being inside of it, uh, I guess, you know, I tried to write about it at the time. And I kept a lot of notes and, uh, and, 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 and was actually approached by a publisher. And we, I had a title for the book and, uh, and a, a, a kind of a theme for the book. And I knew what I wanted to say and was completely outlined. Uh, and there didn't seem to be much question about them buying it. And then I was talking to a friend of mine a mentor of mine, Michael Kahn, who runs the uh, Shakespeare Theater Company in D.C., and he mm-hmm. said, Patrick, you can't write that book. He said the rehearsal room is a sacred space. Yes. And those are, those are private things in there as a family. And I'm so glad that happened. I was a godsend that he said that to me at that moment. Of course I should have known that. But you but have... You, but you could write your autobiography, and that could be pieces and parts of it without it revealing all Yes, that. and I think time also will... Uh, mitigate some of that. One of the things I thought would be very rewarding and uh, educational for people, and I've thought about doing a lot, uh, is getting a whole group of us together, 20 or 30 of us from Spider-Man, all in a room with a tape recorder. Because my guess is we'd have different memories of the same event. Probably right. So that then you would have all kinds of versions of something and not somebody laying down, this is the way it happened. You know, It would be good to have to have that because... It was, it was a unique event. I'll never go through anything like that no, again. No, and I think probably nobody ever will. Right. You know, right. And, and, and so, yeah, you went through something that um, clearly informs a lot of what you do now, I have no doubt, yeah. whether you even realize it or not. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, I'll never complain that a tech is too long. I was in tech for, you know, four months, five months. <laughs> um, I'll never complain about a tech. I'll never uh, worry about that kind of thing. In the Hades town we just did in Edmonton, uh, Reeve Carney, who had played Spider Man, and TV Carpio, who played Arachne, were both in Hades town with me, and we would go over stories of it, and it was it was an amazing, amazing experience. I wouldn't I wouldn't trade for anything. Reeve Carney, what did he, did he just do? Uh, show Showtime, uh-huh. yeah, Penny Dreadful. Penny Dreadful. Oh my God, he's fantastic. Yeah, that show was fantastic. I love that show too. So were you followed by Bob Cuccioli? Did he follow yeah, Bob, you in the park? Yeah, Bob followed me in the role, yeah. So cl- clearly I've known Bob for a little yeah. while. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right, because Jekyll and Hyde. Jekyll yeah. and Hyde, yeah. yeah. So that was... That, that's yeah, it. Bob replaced me and um, and I think played it to the end of the run. If, and, I, you know, you guys have similar looks to you. You have yeah. similar vocal quality. Yeah, we you. do a lot of stuff where uh, either he'll not be able to do something and I'll go in and do it or I'll not be able to do something and he'll go in. It's happened a lot. So so I have to ask about magic. Are you, are you still a magician? Do you still practice magic? I do. Uh, there were a number of years where... And I, did that help you with the show, being a magician? Yes, it helps with everything because uh, as a magician, you're doing something that is so audacious uh, it's as audacious as what stand-up comics do, maybe even a little more, uh, which is I will now stand in front of you for the next however long and entertain you with nothing, is what a stand-up comic <laughs> exactly does. Exactly right. I'll just stand here, and you'll pay me money, and it's just unbelievably ballsy. And a magician goes a step further, which is not only will I entertain you, but I will fool you. And uh, so... When I was a kid and full of myself, I didn't have any problem with that. I got into my 30s and 40s, and I, I just kind of lost the cojones for it. I, mm. couldn't, I couldn't stand up there anymore and say, I will, because a magician has to dominate an audience. He may do it through charm. He may do it by pretending to be a nebbish. But in whatever way he's doing it, he's dominating the audience. He's making them look where he wants to look yeah. and not where he doesn't want them to look. Um, that's what a magician does. And I kind of lost the courage. And then, um, 
I guess about 10 years ago, it started to interest me a lot again. And I began to get into it more and more and began performing mainly at things for friends. You know, I did, I, I performed, you know, uh, at Julie Taymor's birthday party, mm. just off the off the cuff, mm. you know. I performed, you know, at I'll perform at at a cabaret, you know, when somebody else might be singing a song, maybe I'll do. So do you continue to practice? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, I continue to practice and sometimes somebody asks me to do something, I'll pull out a deck of cards or coins or something. There's nothing more rewarding in a way than that look on someone's face. Oh, of course, that's because you're totally astonishing yeah, somebody. Yeah. He even I, tricked me recently because I know so many things now um, and I've seen so many of his tricks. And when you know certain principles, you can figure out a lot of things. And at Brian's 40th birthday, you did a card trick and a card trick. And I'm like, I know, I know, I know. And then you did one. And I was like, well, OK, all right, you got me. It's been 22 years and you got me. So you're a close up expert. No, you're an illusionist. I was an illusionist. What I did when I, you know, when I was doing those conventions, the International Brotherhood of Magicians and Society of American Magicians. I did a, a full-scale illusion show. Uh, I used to do a two-hour full-scale illusion show, you know, sawing ladies in half, floating them in the air, all of that. Wow. But um, obviously you can't cart that around with you. And no. you And you can cart around a pack of cards and some coins and things. So I moved to doing close-up and mentalism. Now I do a lot of mentalism, divining people's thoughts or things like that because... Uh, what am I having for dinner? No, I have no idea. <laughs> but 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 the reason I I love that is because uh, if you make a bird appear out of the air, that was one of my favorite kinds of magic. I used to have a menagerie of doves, and I loved them. And I raised them, and we had them all in our backyard, and I loved them, and I loved that kind of magic, that visual, beautiful magic. But the audience never thinks oh, that bird just materialized. They think, where the hell did that bird come from? Uh -huh. He hit it somewhere, uh -huh. and it came from somewhere, and I don't know where it came from. When you read someone's thoughts, they think, I wonder if he can really do that. <laughs> and that little bit of doubt is a nice thing to have in the mm -hmm. room. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's probably a lot. It's more mysterious on top of magic being mysterious to begin right. with. Which, of course, is what the, the great magicians of the... You know, the turn of the century and the mid-century, people like Houdini, Chung Ling Su, Thurston, Keller, all of those people, the, the audiences actually thought that. When Thurston would levitate a woman, he the story that went along with it was that he'd just been to the Middle East. He'd learn from <laughs> uh, uh, fakirs and shamans how to do this. There was a certain way you did it. You have a little boy come up and put his hand on the floating lady and make a wish. And the audience was transported into this realm of imagination where they thought, well, I wonder if he really did bring back these mysteries from from the East. But now the world's gotten smaller. People don't have that belief. <clears throat> so if you can just allow that to enter the room, I'm always very clear to say, I cannot read minds. I'm divining this another way. But they don't believe you. Yeah, and well, they still think, no, you're doing something. And I don't are, know what it are is. Are you a member of the Magic Castle? No. I've never been a member of the Magic Castle, but when you're a member of, for example, International Brotherhood of Magicians, you can you can go to the Magic sure, Castle. Sure, sure. Well, I've been there many, many times. Always, a, it's a great thrill. I'm a big Magic aficionado, and I've actually, I when you know, I've done a lot of lighting design in my life, and I actually designed a huge illusion show. Oh wow! In at the at the Reno Hilton, on wow, the, a really big stage, hundred foot stage. So, as the lighting designer, you were uh, oh, yes. in on a lot of oh, the yes. secrets because oh, yes. lighting has a lot to do oh, with yes. a lot of things. Oh yes, I I learned a whole lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> So cool. <laughs> yeah. All right. So we're at, we've been going for oh over an hour already. Believe it or not, we're gonna sort of wind down toward the end because actually I I need to wrap this up a little bit. I'm curious, what's the best direction you've ever been given? Good question. Um, usually, with me, I think because. I, uh, my initial roles were usually quite flamboyant and sometimes in outdoor spaces, um, that the direction that I, I can do less and trust the audience more is almost always a direction that I can take, um, and, and, and 
and that's a good direction for me. I'm trying to think of a specific one. I've had so many great directors. You know, I've worked. Uh, I think Joe Mantello is one of the greats. No question. Julie Taymor, Stephen Burkoff, Dan Sullivan, Jack O'Brien. Michael Kahn. Michael Kahn. I feel like you said recently he, there was a piece of direction he gave you, and you said that's the best that piece That Michael of gave me, right? I wish I could remember Yeah, I, you. I, I'm racking my brain. This wasn't one of the no, questions no. you gave no, me in no. advance. I'm racking my brain. Go on to the next one. I'll keep thinking Sh- about sure, it. Sure, sure. And, and so... What should directors avoid with actors? Telling them what to do. Telling them what to do. Um, and what what then should a director do to get them, to get you to do what they want you to do? First of all, I think I think the, the great directors are patient. They realize you're in process. And so they don't they don't need you to be there on the first day. If they see you going down a terrible road, mm-hmm. they can say, Okay, walk this way, not that way. Um, Ultimately, it has to be your performance. It does. It can't and, be their performance. It's and, your performance. And, and, but it has to fit within their vision. Absolutely. But the good news is, generally, at a certain point, uh, uh, the, the, the people working at the level I want to be working at all know that. They're all very good in that way. I'll tell you a direction that was really a good one. I was working for Doug Hughes, and I was playing opposite Frank Langella. And he was playing Sir Thomas More, and I was playing King Henry VIII. Mm-hmm. And Langella has been one of my idols since I was a kid, because in addition to every other interest I had, I was fascinated with vampires. And Langella was the great Dracula, Dracula of my youth. Sure. And he also happens to be a magnificent classical actor. And... He came into rehearsal the first day, like so many of the great actors do, with every single line absolutely learned cold. Stacy Keach did the same thing with Kentucky Cycle, with seven hours of material. Frank came in without a book, playing opposite me, looking at me, simply responding off of me. And I got a bit cowed uh, because I had such hero worship for him. And I remember saying to him, Frank, I know... Uh, um, I'm I'm having a little bit of trouble like going toe to toe with you right now but don't worry I'll get there and uh you know and eventually I'll be I'll I'll, I'll stand center stage with confidence and Frank said and I shall meet you there <laughs> but but um but uh Doug Hughes called me when we were in the theater so we were already in I think previews and he said, come here, out of my dressing room. Walked out, walked out, all the way up the stairs, up in the fly rail. And I thought, I'm being fired. I'm certain I'm being fired because he's taking me into the most private spot in the theater where no one can hear. Well, way up in the fly rail with all the weights and mm-hmm. the pulleys and the ropes. And he said, we're just about to open the show. And he said, Patrick, I need you to remember who the star of this show is. And I said, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. Am I stepping on Frank? And he said, no, you're the star. Mm. When you step on that stage, you're the king. You come on for 20 minutes, you tear him a new asshole. You're the star. Mm-hmm. Do not back off of him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, that freedom was one of the great, because he hired me because he knew I could do that. And, but I wasn't doing what I knew I could do. Because you were I was, intimidated. I was, so, I was in awe. Yeah, I wasn't even sure. intimidated. Frank never. Frank was the kindest person to me in the world invited in, me into his dressing room every intermission, joked with me. We, we both of us loved dirty jokes, and we would swap dirty jokes all the time. He did everything to make me com- comfortable, but I was just so in awe of him that I, I backed off of myself. There's a, there's a, a famous, I, I don't know if it's apocryphal or not, but there's a famous story about Alec Baldwin doing the movie of Glengarry Glen, Glen Ross, and I think it was directed by James Mangold. I could be wrong, but in, in any event, the direct he came in and here's... Uh, Pacino and uh, Jack Lemmon and uh, Alan Arkin and all these just towering actors. And he had to come in and rip them a new asshole, as you right. say. And he, he wasn't able to get there. And the, the, the direction all he gave him was, was just come in and piss all over them. Yeah. And that's what he did. And he yeah. gave this amazing performance. Yeah. When, he, when he walks into that room, he just tears every one of them. Yeah. Right. Down. Well, that's a great image. You know, something that I tell my students is sometimes the spine of a character might be an image like that. Yeah. Like pissing on someone. Um, 
uh, Brando when he was doing um, Streetcar. He, uh, Kazan gave him the image of Blanche being this this delicate china cup mm. that was worth a fortune that had been owned by an emperor and that he had to put it in his house. Mm. And that when it was in his house at first, he would look at it and sort of resent it because he couldn't go near it and it might break. And then eventually he said, I'm going to drink out of that fucking cup. And then I'm going to smash that cup because mm -hmm. I've come to resent that cup so much. And that image, that sort of as if, became a spine for Brando of the character, which is a, a different part of the brain, you know, uh, like you're saying, like like him pissing on it. So, yeah, I think that was a great, great direction from Doug Hughes. And I don't know that I got there right away, but eventually maybe I did. But it sunk in. Yeah. And that's what a director needs to do, and they need to set you up to get it to sink yeah. in. Yeah. A director, you know what a director is doing? They're looking for life. They're Because what we do in the room very frequently is an imitation of life or a... Uh, 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 a facsimile of a life. Representation. A representation of life. A demonstration of life. Of a it. demonstration of life instead of life itself. And so the director's looking for those moments when life itself emerges and encouraging them so that eventually we have a string of them and they become a play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, yeah, for sure. Because you're once, you, once you've written it and had an actor say it, you're already immediately one step at least removed from reality. That's right. So now you have to come back and find that reality again. That's right. And the, and the words on the page, of course, are, are, are uh, like uh, uh, the blueprint of a building. Yes. They are no more the play that's itself correct. than a blueprint is a building. And that's exactly what I teach in my classes. We're just the, ar we're, we're the architect. We're not the contractor. Right. That's a whole different set of... Uh, difficulties and challenges right. you're just simply setting out that skeleton for everyone else to follow that's right and have and teaching an actor i think becoming masterful as an actor is learning to balance complete almost reverential respect for the text with complete fuck you to the text sure then and, and they both have to exist yes i don't care if it's shakespeare or shaw or 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 Neil Simon, the two things have to exist. That yes, I mean these are the words. I respect them absolutely. I will say them all, and then they have to become life. Y they, they have to become action. It cannot be precious. Right. It has to be something that you absolutely treat with with respect, but not as precious. Right. And I think that that's a very important thing that sometimes newer um, folks in the business don't quite get. They think it all has to be, you have yeah. to revere it, and you don't. I tell my students, you, you have to piss on the hydrant. You Make it your <laughs> hydrant, you know, because um, otherwise, what's the point? Why do I want to come and see your Blanche Dubois if you haven't made it your Blanche Dubois? Yeah. I don't. I can read the play. Right. And you can go watch the movie. Yeah. And that's, you know, Vivian Lee and, and Brando and so on, and yeah. that's what that is, yeah. right? Um, so we're we're coming to the end of this absolutely spectacular episode that we're having here with the great Patrick Page and with Paige Davis, um, who's graciously sat in with us today. So that's just been an extra treat, believe me. Um, and I'm wondering, in your uh, lifelong experiences in the theater, do you have any particular one quirky, weird, perhaps funny or oddball story that you can lend to us that's just like, that's bizarre when or funny? I when I was doing Lion King, I was playing Scar in Lion King at the New Amsterdam Theater, and the dressing room was, I believe, on the fourth or the fifth floor. And uh, <laughs> oh, sorry, I know where this is going. <laughs> I I hate to stand backstage. It's a pet peeve of mine. Um, I like I walk as quickly from my dressing room out. I don't want to make a stop in the wings. I want to walk from wherever it is out onto the stage. Um, something about that stopping in the wings shuts something down for me. So I always have it perfectly timed. And in this event, there's an elevator. So I have a dresser who holds the elevator and I hold the <laughs> elevator and I, and I go down. So I'm about to go on for my first entrance in the second act. Now, we've already stopped the show once because the young woman playing Nala had injured herself. Mm. So they had had to stop the sh show mid-act in the first act and put in another Nala, which entailed about a 10-minute pause in the first act. So the audience is a bit restless. I go to open my door to my dressing room to go down on my perfectly timed uh, descent to the stage, and the door is locked. Oh. It won't open. <laughs> I try it again, and it won't open. <laughs> and I hear 
you know, on the monitor where the show is. So I go and very quickly get a credit card out of my wallet, and I'm trying to jimmy open the lock, <laughs> and it won't open. And I then I go and grab a pair of scissors, and I'm trying to jimmy open the lock, and it won't open. So I think maybe it'll open from the outside. So I pound on the door a couple times in case there's someone out there. It won't open. So I go, I have a telephone in my room, and I call the stage manager's office. Now I can hear we're like, you know, five seconds from my cue. <laughs> won't open. Now I hear we're past my cue, and I hear the orchestra just vamping the same thing <laughs> over and over, just vamping, 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 just silence. And I now I call the deck. No one answers. And I hear the vamping. And then eventually I hear, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have a technical difficulty, and uh, the show will be pausing for a moment. My phone rings. It's the stage manager, Kat Purvis, one of the best <laughs> stage managers in the business by far. She says very calmly, she says, Patrick, are you okay? <laughs> I say, yeah, I'm okay. She said, are you locked in your room? I said, yes, I am. How did you know? I'm locked in my room. So they sent out somebody to open it, wouldn't open. Uh, eventually, they got the engineer from the building who came and basically had to unscrew the thing and everything. <laughs> <laughs> and it was another 20 minutes before we got the show started again, and I got down there. And so this this uh, story went around Times Square. Everybody knew. And I was eventually, <laughs> I was eventually in an elevator with someone at uh, Manhattan. What's the name of the building where all the actors live? Over there on Eighth Avenue. The Manhattan Pro Pl Plaza. Plaza. Is it Manhattan Plaza? Yeah. And um, I'm in the elevator there, and they see I'm wearing a Lion King jacket. And the and the guy says to me, "Oh, did you hear the thing about the guy who got locked in the elevator?" <laughs> so, yeah, so that was pretty bad. Oh, uh, that's that is one of those stories. That's that's not quite the you know going out on stage naked in your dream, right? But it's that's close. pretty close. Yeah. That's that's I've got to freak you out for a little. I, bit. I have a, a half a dozen of those or more from Spider Man, of course, <laughs> when the show stopped and I was out there with nothing to do. Oh, oh my god! The, well, the the night the critics were there. As a matter of fact, Ben Brantley writes about this in his review. The show stopped at the very moment I was out there with Peter Parker for the fight at the end. And uh, so we were improving in character. And so Reeve, who was uh, not accustomed to improving at the time, went over to the piano where there was a bottle of champagne and a glass of champagne and began just pretending to sip champagne. So as the goblin, I said to him, now, Peter Parker, you be careful with that champagne because you're going to be flying around here in a minute. And I hear they dropped a few of them. <laughs> <laughs> he used to like also play he had a part where he had to well fake play on the piano the guy in the pit was doing it and you used to like keep improvising yeah, on I, the I, piano I, he'd just start like full on like a, a like a lounge singer just like still they, making up lyrics making up lyrics. talking the to the audience the, they, you know? Bono loved the improv so much that he said we got a he had a character that he did that with too in his show <laughs> And so he said, we got to put this in at the top of the second act. So they gave me a little five-minute stretch at the top of the second act where I could kind of do whatever I wanted with the audience. <laughs> and one night, Donald Trump was sitting in the first oh, row. No. And this was where, at the time, where he was uh, no, obviously not a political person or a candidate, but he was going around with this nonsense about Obama's birth certificate. So I said, I just turned into the goblin, and I said, now... Um, I, I've been taking a sum, and I, I, it plays with my mind. Sometimes I think I'm seeing things. For example, I think I can see Donald Trump in the first <laughs> row. And he smiles real big because, of course, now it's about him. Right? Yes, of course. And I said, and I walked down to him, and I said, but the thing is I don't know if it's the real Donald Trump. And I said, sir, can I see your birth certificate? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Did it get a big laugh? It got a huge laugh. Oh. And he, from everyone uh, but him. Beneath his orange makeup, he blushed. I bet he did. <laughs> 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 All right, so do you have one good, solid piece of advice or a tip that those that are trying to make it in the business, trying to come up or sustain a career, either one, um, that will help them along the way? The things I tell people are uh, make work for yourself. Actors are dependent, they believe they're dependent on somebody hiring them. Mm -hmm. And my whole life, I've uh, rejected that. Say, if, if nobody will hire you, write something, put it on in your basement, put it on in your backyard, invite people, do it for free, call in people. If they won't let you 
you know, write something, get a script somewhere, get some public domain script, get some book you really like, get a Christmas Carol, it's in the public domain, mm-hmm. adapt it for the stage. Get you, you like Jane Austen, get a Jane Austen piece, adapt it for the stage, make it a one person thing or make it a six person thing and get five of your friends. Um, just make things, make things because not only will it be, you'll be making yourself better in the meantime. And then the other thing that I, when I was thinking about this question that I think is important is, uh, you, you've got to get outside your comfort zone. So, for example, I was absolutely terrified to move to New York, uh, beyond anything I can describe. Uh, I grew up in a little town that had two thousand people. My um, high school had six hundred students. And then I went to a little college where there were 1,200 students in another little 2,000-person town. The idea of going to a city, and remember that New York in, you know, 1993 was a different place than it is now, more dangerous, uh, scarier. A lot. A lot. Um, And I was just scared out of my mind. And there have been so many times that that has happened where there's been something that terrified me and I chose to just step anyway. And this is something Paige is really, really great at. Paige had, you know, she started as a dancer and then began acting, taking bigger and bigger roles. She didn't have any hosting experience when she went to trading spaces. Every one of those things was stepping outside comfort zone. Then, then you know, a smaller role, then a bigger role. Then she originated a role in a two-hander where she's carrying half the play. Then she did a one-person show, where, or it was, again, a two-hander, but where she's carrying even more of it here in Pittsburgh. And those things where you which, think... Which was great, by the way. Thank you. Uh, um, well, thank you for her. Uh, <laughs> I think it was great, too. But um, Well, and a lot of times I'll Abigail. do things just to see if I can. Right. And, and, you ha- <laughs> and, yeah. and by the way, I just spent time with uh, Ken Davenport in November. Oh, oh how wonderful. <laughs> but you have to risk falling on your face. And uh, when I look back and I try to see, of course, there are so many things where luck plays a of huge course. and in my career where luck has played a, a a role but additionally if i look and say okay so and so and i were sort of side by side and then we're no longer side by side because they chose to not do the thing that frightened maybe played a little more safe like, like it's definitely luck that sandy robinson right Robbins. Robbins. Yeah. San- I was going to say that, and then I thought I was wrong. That Sandy Robbins, like, put his neck out to say, "No, I'll, I'll, mi- I'll make the flight, or I'll miss the flight." But you had, you had put in motion in the universe that this is what you wanted. Now you could have also not been allowed to audition, but that probably that proactiveness in the not to be all spiritual or anything, but just that that proactiveness into the universe would have eventually catapulted you into a Sandy Robbins moment, whether it was that day or not. The fact that he had gone, you'd taken this five-hour drive yeah. and shown up, yeah. which is, of course, 99% of and, the and battle. And, of course, someone like a Sandy Robbins is reading his aura, right? He doesn't even know why he's saying, sure. uh, we're going to give this kid a shot. It's it's the, But it's you're generating it's a proactiveness in your spirit. It's a proactiveness, in, literally, it, and it's a, you know, it's a, yeah, you have to do As, it. I think outside your comfort zone, danger. For me, moving to New York was terrifying. Uh, taking my first musical job was terrifying. I had a, a terrible phobia about singing, and I fell into the Beauty and the Beast role by accident. I told my agent I wanted to turn it down because I was scared of it, and then she. And he met me. And then I met her. <laughs> there you go. I'm so Beauty and the Beast. I think that's, for me, that's it. That make work and then and then take yourself outside your comfort zone uh we haven't talked about my studio but the students that i have in new york i have about just under 100 students now and they i I see that you know people are so down on millennials but these are most of them millennial young people who are so brave they've moved out of their communities into new york they are doing uh service jobs mostly working 
ridiculous shifts so they can get up early in the morning and go audition. And they're the ones that are going to make it, you know, because they... And they are making it with his training. Well... Th- I really wanted him to talk about a- acting process and, and training. We'll do it and, another time. But, uh, but love to. yeah, he's, <laughs> an, he's a magnificent teacher. And, and he's right, you know, he's giving them the tools so that they're really kicking butt in these auditions and they're uh, he also trains them in terms of life lessons. But of- the point I wanted to make was their their courage in moving to New York, yeah. you know, from whatever town they were mm-hmm. in, that doing the hard thing of having four roommates and doing a service job so they can go on auditions and eventually get their equity card and eventually break through and get that piece of luck that they need. It's a it's a it's a little bit of a crass thing to say, but you know, I've been on jobs where I have heard people who are from the city like if you do say a regional theater job or something and you go in and you have the lead or you have a big part or whatever and you'll hear grumblings from the people who live in that city you know why do they hire somebody from New York and I didn't get hired and I live here and and kind of what we want to say sometimes is well why don't you move to New York Mm -hmm. and compete in the most difficult city in the world for this job and live in, you know, roach infested 200 square foot apartment sure. or whatever it is and then talk to me about why did I get the part? Like the the theaters they go to that's where they audition. It, you could always fly there to audition too. Of course. You know, so well, sometimes it's hard to get in. Well, sometimes audition. it's hard. It, it's hard but you have but to I, like push yourself that, to do that. That courage. The uh, courage and to that, go. And that is it's it's the driving the 5 hours. It's the going to New York. It is that yeah. it's going above like you say out of your comfort zone. I think that there's no question about it. People that move to El Los Angeles to to, Same. to get into Same. that part of thing um, it's just that kind of a challenge. Yeah. It's, we see kids at school here who grew up in little teeny tiny towns in Ohio and western Pennsylvania and so on, and it's a big deal for them to come to Pittsburgh. Yes, yes. Well, this is a great place to work, sure by the is. way. It's a and wonder. And, it is. and people have great careers here. They do. I've often said if I could grant them all one wish, it would be the ability to hear no innumerable times and never have it get them down. Uh, I saw Emma Stone on... Uh, CBS Sunday Morning once, and she she just won the Oscar. And so her condition for coming on was that she could bring her girlfriends with her. And her girlfriends were not famous, but they were actors. Mm -hmm. And she had been with them at the beginning of the career. Mm -hmm. And they asked these other young ladies what was different about Emma. And they didn't say Emma was more talented, Emma was prettier, Emma was... They said every time Emma heard no, it just gave her more juice to get up and do the next one. And when we heard no, it got us down. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to be able to hear it, get back up, learn from it. You know, as we were saying earlier, when they when they told me, "Hey, we heard you might be difficult to work with. Change it." But uh, Patrick always says, "You know, if you get used to hearing no, you're in good company." Spielberg heard no. Absolutely. Disney heard no. Yeah. Everybody hears no. Yeah. Everybody. There's hears nobody no. that's only heard yes. Yeah. It's the it's the and I have trouble with it too. By the way, hearing no, but it's it's hearing no, but actually hearing maybe or yes. Yeah. You know, it's it's not no. Yeah. It's just not this moment. Not this it's moment. It's just not now. Not this right. moment. It's That's exactly right. 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 Uh, nobody's ever said, it's. and I will never say this to a student, by the way. I've heard of teachers who do this, not here, by the way, but at, at, I've heard of teachers doing this where they'll say to a student, you should never do this. Yeah. You're not good enough to do this yeah. or you're not, you don't have talent. I would never, ever, ever say that even though I might think to myself, this student's going to really struggle because yeah. they just don't have the chops right now. Yeah. But that doesn't mean they won't. That's, That's right. right. And I, you know, we we do, you know, courses, four-week courses, six-week courses, and I advance the students through the courses one at a time. And I'm frequently amazed that someone who I thought would be absolutely hopeless six months in all of a sudden blossoms. There they are. Well, that's And if I had told them back then, no, I'm not going to advance you into the next class, we would have lost this person who turns out to be one of my best students. Well, you, you, I'm sure we have very similar experiences in slightly different ways, and that is there is nothing like a student that comes in as a freshman and they're wide-eyed and they have no clue. I yeah. mean, they're clueless. And they might have a little bit of ability, but it's a little hard to see. And four years in, they're in full bloom, and you go, wow. Yeah, yeah. It's that's amazing. a mu- to- beautiful thing. Yeah, it's, so, it's probably the most gratifying thing there is. It is absolutely the yeah. most gratifying. Well, this has just been a marvelous oh, 90 minutes, believe ah, it or not. Right. And what a great treat to have Paige in the studio with us. <laughs> thank you, and Steve. thank you, Patrick, for so much 
great thank, information. Thank you. And, and we can do this again sometime. We can even do it on the phone if you wish. And we can have a whole hour on nothing but acting specific uh, on it. It's always my pleasure. Well, that's great. Thank you for coming in today. Thank you. Today's Story Beat tip. Play within the story's sandbox. Story is the sandbox that screenwriters play in. Once you establish or determine the parameters of the story that you plan to tell, which defines the story's sandbox, you are, for the most part, obliged as a writer to stay within the confines of that sandbox. Is that true in all cases? No, but it is for most tales true. Story encompasses the world in which the characters dwell. It requires both heartfelt passion and logic within an established framework in order to be palatable to an audience that wants to understand what is happening. For example, audiences would likely be thrown off if after the opening scene in The Godfather, Attila the Hun rode in on horseback, leading a horde of warriors seeking to do battle with Don Corleone's mobsters. It would be highly illogical within the established story parameters. Think of the openings of the following movies. Star Wars, Easy Rider, Casablanca, 2001 A Space Odyssey, The Hangover, and Little Miss Sunshine. Of course, this list could go on and on, but the screenwriters of each of these films set up the story's world quite well. Each story unfolds in very different settings. The writers then adhered to the logical world of each story throughout the rest of the tale. In short, the story stayed contained within a specific world. You must do the same with your stories. Story is the foundation of the movie maker's craft. Without story, you would have random events in no particular order with neither a point of view nor a purpose. Without story, a tale would quickly devolve into chaos. Some people tolerate chaos, well, most do not. Most people can tolerate some chaos, usually when it is limited and managed as a smaller piece of something bigger. Each story lives within its own contained universe, its individual sandbox. Here's the thing, good storytelling is the opposite of chaos, even when the perception of chaos operates within a story. Good storytelling must be well controlled. All of the artists required to create a movie or play must rely on the script in order to give them clues about how to do their jobs. The writer, director, actors, and all of the technicians and craftspeople become the audience's guide to understanding the story and its various meanings. If you, the writer, don't create the story's sandbox for the artists to play in, they will be lost. And so will the audience. And so we've come to the end of today's story beat. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a comment on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great episodes to you. This podcast would not have been possible without the generous support of the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.